So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4, Hebrews chapter 5. For every high priest is taken from among men. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. And so we're going to be looking at Jesus, our high priest. And as we begin, the Old Testament priests, when you look at the priesthood in the Old Testament, have been referred to as similar to what we would call a bridge builder, a bridge builder to God. The priests would represent God to man and man to God. And in, in a sense, in a sense, they could be regarded as similar to ushers. They had the responsibility of bringing man to God. So people at that time could not come directly to God. And so what the Lord did is he gave them the priesthood. So priests would mediate. They would offer daily and yearly sacrifices on behalf of the people. And there were certain qualifications, and we'll be looking at some of this as we look into the chapter, but there were certain qualifications and duties that they were to perform. We see in chapter 5, verse 1, for example, I'm just touching this, but we see that in, in verse 1 that he was called by God and not by, not by man. In chapter 5, verse 4, we see that the priest offers gifts and sacrifices to God. A third thing that you'll see about the priest is found in the Old Testament book of Leviticus in chapter 16, and it speaks of the high priest who offers highest sacrifice. He offers the atonement. Hebrews chapter 7, we'll see that in verse 25, that the, uh, the priest mediates between God and man. A fifth thing is that, according to Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, he would bless the people of God. And so the writer is going to point some things out. I'm just touching this briefly. Uh, he's going to point out that Jesus had all of these qualifications. Now, because Israel had a priesthood, what the, the Jewish person could ask the Christian would be, we have a priest who mediates for us. Who mediates for you? Who mediates between you and God? Who is your high priest? You see, without a mediator... How can your sins be forgiven? And who is it that will offer sacrifices on your behalf? And so the answer is supplied by the believer is that we point to Jesus Christ as our priest and our mediator. Because according to John 14, 6 and other places, it is Jesus who brings us to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So we would point Jesus out as being our mediator. In 1 Peter, we saw this in chapter 3, verse 18, how Peter had said, Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Or Romans 8, 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, yes, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Or 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. It's a man, Christ Jesus. And so the Jew would ask the Christian, who is your mediator? And the answer is Jesus Christ. And that's what we're seeing develop here in chapter 5. In this section, the writer is uh, developing the revelation that Jesus Christ is high priest. Now, in chapter 3, we already saw this in verse 1. He had already pointed to Jesus in that way. And what we'll see in these verses is that, one, that God appointed him, that he was taken from among men, that he understood human weakness, and he offered sacrifices on man's behalf. So we're going to be seeing that as we go through this. And so in verse 1, beginning there, it says, Every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So the high priest, notice with me, was taken. The word taken, the high priest was taken or chosen or selected. That's what taken means. And he was chosen or selected from among men. And the high priest being taken or chosen was selected by God and not by man. 
He said in verse 4, no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. And so the position was not gained through ambition. It wasn't something that he studied for. It wasn't something he planned for. It was something that he was chosen for. And so from the beginning, the high priest had been appointed as high priest by God. Now, Moses' brother's name was Aaron. The, the name Aaron means light bringer. And he was the first high priest selected by God. In, in Exodus, in chapter 28, verse 1, it says, Have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithmar, so that they may serve me as priests. In, in uh, Exodus 29, verse 9, it said, put headbands on them, tie sashes on Aaron and his sons. The priesthood is theirs by a lasting ordinance. In this way, you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. So when he says put headbands on them, they were lowriders. And so, <laughs> don't ask me why I said that. <laughs> And so what is his point? His point is that Jesus was appointed by God to be high priest. And that's something we'll see emphasized several times throughout the chapter. And so one, he was taken from among men. Two, every high priest was taken from among men. So one, he was chosen by God. But two, he was taken among, from among men, meaning that he wasn't chosen. Uh, angels, in other words, were not chosen. He was chosen from among men. A priest in other words, is to partake in the nature of the ones for whom he officiates. Because only a man can understand human nature. Only a human being understands human temptations. And so one, he was taken from among men, not angels. And third, he understood weaknesses and had compassion on the ignorant as well as the erring. Verse 2 says he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray. Why is that? This is because he himself is also beset or subject to weaknesses. So a high priest is human. And as a human being, obviously understood the weakness that human beings went through. That's why when you read your Bible, you see things like Proverbs 20, verse 9, where a question is asked, who can say I have kept my heart pure? I am clean and without sin. Well, the obvious answer is no human being outside of Jesus himself could ever say that. So he had the ability to understand human weakness. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 says, There is not a just man upon earth that does good and sins not. And so he actually would be disqualified if he's ignorant of his own weakness. Because if he's ignorant of his own weakness, he will not have compassion. See, the more that you're aware of your own sinfulness, your own weakness, the more understanding and compassionate you can be with somebody else. And when you understand your own weakness, and sometimes it just takes a long time to get there. When you're young, you look at all these people and you think, how could you be so bad? When you get old, you wonder, how could I be so bad? Over time, you begin to have a better grip and understanding of yourself. You begin to understand that and not make excuses for, by the way, but understand that we are beset by human frailty. That's just a fact. That we will do things we didn't want to do. And so Messiah symp sympathized with human weakness. And in his ability, because Jesus is God-man, he has human flesh, he had human nature, because he had the awareness of those things, he could represent us to God. Isaiah 40, it's one of my, I think it's one of the, a very sweet verse, Isaiah 40, verse 11. Uh, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them in his bosom or close to his heart, and he gently leads those who are with young or have young. Um, that's our Savior. He understands us. He, he leads us with gentleness like a shepherd. You see, Jesus participated, and I want to make a, a point here. Jesus participated in men's feelings but he did not participate in man's sins. Jesus never sinned. 1 Peter 2 verse 22 says that he committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. In 1 John 3 verse 5, John said, You know that he, speaking of Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So Jesus understood man's feelings, 
but Jesus never committed sins. He did understand, and he has compassion for us. Now, the priest, according to verse 2, dealt gently with the ignorant and those going astray. When he speaks of the ignorant, it's not simply those without knowledge. I, I remember on one occasion, I was speaking to somebody many years ago now, but I'll never forget the response because I was speaking to somebody and they were pretty intense about whatever it is we were talking about. And I said something like, well, that's because they're ignorant. Oh, did they ever get mad at me? And it, I wasn't calling them ignorant. I should have, but I didn't. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry. I said that it offended you. I said, I, don't, I didn't mean to do that. I said, but do you know what the word ignorant means? Because sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't. Do you know what the word ignorant means? No. I said, you're ignorant. No, I said, it, <laughs> it simply means without knowledge. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a slur. It's not a slam. It's not something to put you down. It's just speaking of our condition. We, we are without knowledge. We need to be instructed. That's simply what it means. And so he dealt gently with the ignorant, those who were sinning because they didn't know. They're sinning by mistake. They're doing things that they think are okay, and they're not. In our day, I've spoken to people who call the, the woman they're with, and they're introducing her to me. They'll call her my fiance. And so the first thing that we're going to talk about is how long have you been living together? Because a lot of people will use that term to speak of their partner and that they're, they're living with. Now, in the older times, we would call it shacking up. But today, it's called a fiancé. Same thing. Same thing. But a lot of times, these are people who were never raised in, in, in faith. They weren't raised in a church. It's not like they're, think, they're thinking that I'm doing this. They're, sometimes they're just not aware. They just aren't aware. And so you treat them gently with understanding and loving, and you help them to see, well, the best way to deal with this, and you share with them about what marriage is, and, 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 and we've seen more than one time, we've had, we've had uh, actual weddings performed in our church on a Sunday after a Sunday service a couple times, where we've asked those of you who are living with somebody, and you want to make it right with the Lord, and I've shared some things, we'll have a community wedding. And so people in our church have gotten things together. They've gotten flowers, put all things together, had a little reception. And we performed a wedding for those who are living together. Remember, John, when we did that for you? Remember? <laughs> yeah. And you were so blessed, weren't you? <laughs> and so I better hurry up. I'm looking at the time. So one is ignorant. They sin by mistake. And then two, he speaks of going astray. Now, going astray speaks of being led into error. Now, again, that may be unintentional. They're just going the wrong way. In, in Numbers 15, 28, it says, The priest is to make atonement before the Lord for the one who erred by sinning unintentionally. And when atonement has been made for him, he'll be forgiven. And so that's what the priest did. Now, because of this, according to verse 3, he is required as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And so he would offer gifts and sacrifices. He's required for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices and sins. Now, he would, also, uh, he would offer what we call a gift, and these are things that they would do, and I'm just touching on it, which could refer to uh, grain offerings, financial gifts. You see that in uh, Leviticus chapter 2. They're, they're called bloodless sacrifices. They reflect the dedication of a person and their possessions completely to God as an act of gratitude. But sacrifices are called sin offerings. So they would offer sin offerings. Now, that doesn't eradicate the ability to sin. It provided forgiveness of sins. So the priest offers sin offerings, notice, for himself as well as for the people. And that tells us that the human priest had sin that had to be dealt with. Leviticus 4 verse 3 says, If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. 
And so he was a human being beset by sin who needed the offerings himself. Now, verse 4, we already looked at it. No man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God. So he returns to what he had introduced this chapter with in verse 1. And now he builds it. Verse 5, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. It was he who said to him, you are my son today, I have begotten you, as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so priests were from the tribe of Levi. I want you to notice he said Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. Priests were from the tribe of Levi, but Jesus was from a different tribe. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. So the question would be asked, how can Jesus, who was from the tribe of Judah and not Levi, Levi being where the priests were taken from, the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, how could Jesus be high priest if he's not a Levite? Well, it says in verse 5, it was he who said to him, you are my son today, I have begotten you. So he's saying that Jesus had a right, and I'm going to develop this for a moment. Jesus had a right to the office, but his installment in that office came after his resurrection. When he says, today I have begotten you, that is hearkening back to the resurrection. How do we know that? Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says that Jesus, through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he is appointed through the resurrection. He's from the tribe of Judah. When he says in verse 6, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, there's an important point being made here. Again, his priesthood isn't Levitical. It predates the Levitical priesthood. He's like one called Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, his priesthood, Melchizedek's priesthood predated, and therefore this would make Jesus's, and we'll look at this a little bit more, his priesthood superior to that of Aaron's. So let me introduce somebody to Melchizedek. Melchizedek, and I'll give you some basic information. Melchizedek is mentioned 11 times in the Bible, 11 times. He's mentioned in the book of Genesis, in the book of Psalms, And here in the book of Hebrews, Melchizedek is mentioned nine times. Melchizedek is a king, and that's pointed out in Scripture, as well as a priest. In Genesis 14, 18, it reveals there that he was the king of Salem. Salem was a name for Jerusalem. So he was the king of Salem. The king of Jerusalem, Psalm 110, verse 4 Speaks of the, it speaks in this way, the Lord is sworn and will not relent. He said, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So he's a king and a priest. Now, the name Melchizedek, to build this a bit, is actually translated king of righteousness. In chapter 7, we'll see that. Let's see, we're in chapter 5. We'll see that in, uh, next year. In, in chapter 7, he is called the king of Salem. The word Salem means, pre, uh, means peace. He is the king of righteousness, and he is the king of peace, which goes all the way back to Genesis 14, 18. Now, Melchizedek lived centuries before Aaron, but his priesthood is never spoken of in Scripture as ending. Aaron's priesthood did. It ceased when Jesus was resurrected. Jesus is our high priest. There is no need for a Levitical priesthood anymore. So it ended. It ceased when Jesus was resurrected. Now, the temple and the sacrifices ended in A.D. 70. It was temporary. But Jesus' priesthood is like Melchizedek's. It is forever. It doesn't end is the point. And so it says in verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him 
who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And now he's building on Jesus Christ, who has a priesthood after the manner of Melchizedek, a never-ending priesthood. Melchizedek's predating being superior to Aaron's, the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. He now points out some things concerning this priest, Jesus Christ. Again, verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh he offered up prayers and supplications. That would be the days of his flesh speaks of his incarnation in the 33-year lifespan of Christ. He offered up prayers and supplications. Well, prayers, expressions of need. Supplications, urgent request. Vehement cries, it speaks of a loud outcry of somebody who is deeply disturbed. And tears would be a visible manifestation of grief. And that's what he's speaking about. In the days of his flesh... He offered up prayers, supplications, vehement cries, and tears. So he's hearkening back to something. What is he speaking of? He's speaking of Jesus in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane. Remember how in Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 39, uh, it, it reads, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So those were his prayers and his supplications, his urgent request. In Luke twenty two forty four, being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of, of blood falling on the ground. These are the vehement cries and the urgent requests. And then Matthew twenty six forty two, he he went away a second time. He prayed, my father. If it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. So who is he praying to? He's praying to the one who was able to save him from death. Now, when it says save him from death, that is literally, the, the, the Greek is ek thanatos, out of. Ek it speaks of being taken out of. Thanatos speaks of, the, of death or the grave or whatever. It speaks literal, literally of being taken out of death. So, this is, this is important to understand. He was not praying not to die because he knew his mission. Jesus knew why he came. Remember in John 12, 27, how he said, my heart is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, he went on to say, no, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Jesus knew he had an hour. He knew he had a time. And so he came to obey his father. What he's praying for is his father's promise. What was his father's promise? Resurrection. He was praying in agreement with the promise of his father that he would be raised from the dead. Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful or your holy one see decay. So he was simply receiving and praying according to the will of his father and receiving the promise and that's what he was praying about. He wasn't saying, I don't want to die. I had a guy many years ago, a friend of mine, who said to me, he said, you know, I think when Jesus was, and I was a new Christian when he said this, and, and I never forgot what he was saying. He said, you know, I think that when Jesus was, was praying in the garden, he was praying because he enjoyed living so much, he just didn't want to stop enjoying life. And I, and I said to myself, I said, I'm, I'm not, I was a brand new Christian, but I thought, no, that, that uh, no, that's ignorant. No, that, that, that's without knowledge. Um, no, I don't think Jesus was enjoying himself so much that he just wanted to hang around some more. You know, and sometimes people, I think because we don't value the cost and the sacrifice of Christ, because we, we may think that his death on the cross was something that was more like his job. That's what it was his duty to do. That's what he was supposed to do. Therefore, he did it. No, he, he didn't want to go through that experience, and yet he chose to, and he did so in obedience to his father, fulfilling the will of his father in order that people might be saved. Now, he submits himself. Remember what he said, thy will, your will be done. You see, he was heard, verse 7 says, because of his godly fear. In other words, his, his father listened to him, but his father didn't remove the cup. 
This is speaking of when it says he was heard. This is speaking in reference to his submission because he prayed, thy will be done. And he submitted himself to the will of his father. He was heard, thy will be done. And he submitted. Now, here's an interesting verse, verse eight, where it says, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He learned obedience. He learned obedience. Now, on the one hand, if we think of it as like, well, he needs to, because he's lacking a certain thing, he needs to learn this. Well, we need to remember that he already always was obedient. In John 8, 29, he who sent me is with me. The Father hasn't left me alone. I do always those things that please him. Jesus already was obedient. So what is it that he's, Learning, he's learning the full cost of obedience by experience. As God, he knows all things. As man, he experiences suffering and learns the price in a practical, experiential way, learning the price that full obedience exacts. And so that's what he did in his obedience. He learned the full price in the sense that he went the full way. Now, having been perfected, verse 9 he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Perfected. When he says, having been perfected, he became the author. The word perfected has nothing to do with moral perfection. Jesus was already perfect. He never sinned. What this is speaking of is he was brought to full qualification to be savior through death. That's how he became our savior. He died. He fulfilled his father's will. He hanged on a cross, gave up his life. And so he was perfected in the sense that he was brought to the full qualification of what it means to be a savior. And so he completely and forever accomplishes the work that he was sent to perform. And because he completely and perfectly did that, he can save anyone who comes to him in faith for salvation. There's nobody in this room, nobody hearing this message, nobody who's alive today that if they heard the message and believed it, there's nobody that God would say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to save you. God calls you through his word and he convicts you by his Holy Spirit. And he can, as he convicts you and convicts me, as he convicts us of our sin and righteousness and judgment. And we say, I'm a most miserable person. I'm lost forever. And I understand that to some degree. I, I'm not right. I, not, everybody, not everybody has a, a moral sense of being wrong in a moral way. Before I got saved, I, I know how I used to speak of myself, and I didn't use the word sinner. That wasn't a word I used concerning myself. I, I knew I was, but the word I used was, I'm sick. And I told that to my dad. I, I said to my dad, I'm sick. And what I meant by that is, I'm messed up. I need help. I don't know what to do. Now, my dad, God bless my dad. My dad thought, well, <laughs> you are. So he sent me to a psychiatrist. But the psychiatrist couldn't talk me out of my sinfulness. What he was trying to help me to do is accept the fact that I am. And we see that even to this day, where we're, where we're told, you know, you shouldn't go to this particular quote-unquote therapy. You shouldn't be going, going to conversion therapy is what they're calling it today. And they're actually forbidding. They're actually banning that conversion therapy. What is that? It's when Christians are speaking to those who are struggling with their sexuality and saying to them, you don't have to be this way. God can give you a new life. They're saying that we're not able to say that. Uh, counselors in school and all there's laws that are being passed against and banning conversion, what they're calling conversion therapy. They're saying you can't preach the gospel. And so when you're speaking to somebody who's messed up, I don't want to make them happy in their sins. I want them to know the truth that sets them free. And this is something, guys, I've said this before. Some of you haven't heard me. I'll say this very briefly. Years ago, I was asked to speak at a high school for its baccalaureate. And prior to going up, one of the teachers or counselors, I forget who it was, approached me just before I went up to speak to the students who were there for a voluntary baccalaureate. And they said to me, you realize, of course, this is a secular, a secular event. Now, baccalaureate is speaking concern. It's a worship service. That's what a baccalaureate is. But they said, she said to me, 
you realize, of course, this is a secular event. You cannot preach the gospel here. You, you, can't, you can't do that. She wanted me to give a pep talk. I'm not good at that. I'm, I'm just not. That's not me. I'm just not good at that. So I smiled at her. She said, so please, you know, you can't talk about Jesus. I said, oh. So I went up, and I still remember some of what I told these high school kids. I still remember saying, you've achieved four years of education, and you've learned many things. And for that, I congratulate you. For all the work and all that you put into this, I congratulate you. You have gained knowledge, and knowledge can be a good thing. But let me share with you something. The knowledge you need to have is the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, and I gave them the gospel. Because there are, and I don't say that to be a heroic figure, it's just the truth. Because all you are is an educated pagan going to hell without Jesus. That's what you are. And the gospel is a message that sets you free and gives you a new life and brings peace and it brings joy. It, it brings a sense of forgiveness. And through the gospel, you become an entirely new person. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, and so that came through Jesus Christ. Had he remained in the grave then we of all people would be most miserable, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15. If he wasn't resurrected, then here we are going through the things we go through, rejected in the way that we are, for nothing if Jesus wasn't resurrected. But he was. And because he was, that gives us hope. And that's why when we perform funerals for, for believers, that's why we can give hope to the family. It's not goodbye. It's I'll see you later because of the promise of Jesus Christ. He closes his eyes here, but he opens them there. And that's the hope that we have. This comes through Jesus Christ, and he is the author of all salvation. He is the author of our salvation. And it says in verse 9, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Hmm. He, according to verse 10, is high priest because God established him to be so. But he goes on to say, we have a lot to say about this. If this is difficult, it's hard to explain. But you, he says, have become dull of hearing. The word dull is, is a simple word. It means to be slow, sluggish. It speaks of lacking force. It can speak of intellectually numb. Your original eagerness to hear the word of God has cooled down. How can I give you further information concerning Melchizedek if you don't care? You become dull of hearing. Now, this is a, an acquired condition. You are no longer ready. You're no longer eager listeners. You become distracted. You're no longer desiring to hear and learn from God. I have more to share with you about Melchizedek. You're just not interested. So their lack of interest causes him concerned because failure to act on what we know is going to result in a hardening of our heart. I don't know what you were like, and I'm obviously, I'm not going to take us further. I'll just stay here for a moment, and then we're going to, we'll have our communion service. I don't know what you were like when you first got saved. I wonder if you were eager to hear and to know more about God. I was. Still am? I was. From a party life, I went to the Christian life. From the party life, I don't know what it's like. I'm so old now, I don't even know. But I can say, as a kid, if you said there's a party here, we would load our car up, and off we went to the party. It didn't have to be a Friday. It didn't have to be Saturday. 
It could be any day of the week. If there's a party, I'm there. And that was me. If there's a party, I'm there. And then you go and you act crazy or whatever you do, whatever you did at parties, that's what I did. And if you had one the next day, I was there. I would go to a party every day if there was a party every day. I was devoted to parties like many of you were. Then I got saved. And I got devoted to Jesus. So it didn't have to be a party. Now it's a Bible study. Now we're jumping in a car with a bunch of Jesus freaks. And we're going to church services. And it was so freaky to my parents that they knew either I was crazy or something good had happened to me. And they eventually said, no, something good happened to him. He's different. Because I was taking my little sisters with me wherever I went. So one was 14, one was 16. Who takes a 14-year-old kid with them to a party? Just an idiot. What big brother wants their two sisters to be in the party scene with them? Very few. But I was taking my sisters, and my dad saw that. My dad saw me load my sisters into the car so I could take them to Bible studies so they could learn about Jesus Christ. And so that was me then, and that's me now. I want to know more about the Lord. But he's saying to them, you grew dull. What happened to you? What happened? You know, sometimes people will go to church, and I'll close with this basic illustration. We'll pick up next week. But sometimes we go to church, and we get involved, and we're serving the Lord, and we're doing all kinds of things, and then we meet somebody, and then we get to dating that person, and then we become serious with them, and then we... We become um, engaged for marriage. We get married. And all the things that brought us together with them, that kept us together, that even caused us to have love and relationship with them, those things sometimes just fade away because now I've got a job, now I've got a house payment, now I've got a family, now, and it just fades away. Whereas before, I want to get into the word. I want to have fellowship with people. I want to know Jesus. I want to have Christian friends. I want to reach people for Christ. Now it's like I got to get up early in the morning. If I go and the kids are grumpy when they wake up, we can, go, we can grow. And you know this is true. I, it's happened to me. I'm not perfect here, of course. It's happened to me where you just get kind of dull of hearing. I've heard that before. I've, I've seen that before. And I've got things I've got to do. And it's not going to hurt if I. And the, uh, the road to backsliding, the trail to black backsliding is very slow. And sometimes almost imperceptible. The things you at one time were doing by habit, you stop doing. One thing at a time. And then some of the things that you avoided, you begin to experiment with again because you think, no, I'm mature enough to handle some of these things. Me, I was an alcoholic. So I'd say, well, I, I can drink a beer. I can have some wine. And the road that, that took me away from those things, I'm traveling back down because I'm spiritual now. I'm mature now. I'm going to heaven now. I know Jesus now. And before you know it, the things that at one time meant so much to you have faded away. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, you were excited at one time. But I can't give you meat because you're babies. You were moving forward, and you've stopped. And I want to tell you more about Malchizedek because there's so much about him you need to know. But I can't. You've become dull of hearing. You're not listening anymore. So I, I encourage you to this in this one last thought. I encourage you with no condemnation for you at all. I, I hope it doesn't sound that way. What will keep you strong? Wake up every morning saying, Jesus, this is a new day. It's the day you gave me. I will rejoice. I'll be glad in it. And I'm going to serve you today. I'm going to get in your word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to have fellowship. I'm going to seek you and do it today. Then tomorrow, do it that day. Then the next day, do it that day. And every day that you're sowing a habit, you're going to ultimately be reaping an eternity. And so when you work in that fashion day to day, you grow and you are somebody who can come to a Bible study and fill those things in because you've already been in the Word. And you say, oh, yeah, I see how that with Romans, how that works. Oh, and Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, you'll begin doing that because you've been in the Word and the Word of God is now in you.